All right, so as promised, we're going to be talking about spasticity and tone management. And I put it in this module because this is the first diagnosis that we're going to be dealing with this problem. And what we're covering here will hold true for any central nervous system problem that is dealing with tone or spasticity. So as we move through the different diagnoses, this, this little piece here will apply to all of them. I just didn't put it in the introduction because it was already so, so long. So let's talk about this a little bit. So this little grid here um, shows us that if uh, a person has a general spasticity problem, meaning throughout their entire body, throughout all their lower extremities, maybe an entire side of their body, that would be a general problem. A focal problem down at the bottom of the grid here would be somebody that has it in, let's say, one specific muscle, the plantar flexors, maybe their bicep, maybe just their shoulder, a pec that's pulling their arm across, that's a local or focal problem. If we want reversible interventions, that would be to the left here and permanent interventions. Now this here, a general intervention for general spasticity that's permanent is selective dorsal rhizotomy. This is primarily or was primarily used in the pediatric population. We're not going to be talking about that today. We're going to be talking about all the rest of these here. So oral medications, intrathecal baclofen, and then of course what we do are all reversible and address general tone or spasticity. A focal intervention for one or two muscles that's reversible would be injection therapy or chemo denervation. We'll be talking about those. And then a permanent solution for a focal problem would be an orthopedic intervention or surgery, tendo Achilles lengthening, these kind of things. Okay, let's move on to our next slide. So what is the evidence support here? So the Evidence supports level A evidence. You guys have had your evidential presentations. Level 1A or A evidence is the strongest. Botox, which we will be talking about in a little bit, there's great evidence out there to support it for upper extremity and lower extremity targeted focal spasticity, intrathecal baclofen, oral medications, and SDR. So all those things I just showed you on the previous slide all have level 1A evidence to support them that they indeed decrease the tone and spasticity. Okay, so hold that thought. So what about things like splinting or taping, doing things for like wrist and finger flexor spasticity, using um, stem or vibration, uh, postural or task-oriented training. So in your O'Sullivan book, for example, I looked at what they wrote in here. There's not a lot on spasticity and tone management. And what they have here is a bit antiquated. And you, as you read through the, what is it, five, two, three paragraphs, something like that, it, it, it's not really, they didn't spend a lot of time on this. And so I'm giving you the most recent evidence based on these guidelines that came out in 2016 uh, for stroke rehabilitation. And so the evidence does not support these interventions for reduction of spasticity. It doesn't mean they don't help other things, but don't say you're doing it to reduce spasticity. You may be doing it to improve motor control because there's no carryover from one session to the next if you're doing these things for spasticity management. And that's really kind of my pet peeve for a lot of these interventions that are recommended in the therapy world is there's really no evidence to support that. And I'm giving you the most up-to-date date evidence here. Okay. So does decreasing spasticity improve function? Therein lies the question. So if we decrease their spasticity by some of these medical interventions, is that improving their function? Well, there's some more, more recent research, 2010, 2013, you see here, the gait velocity uh, can improve with Botox injections to the gastroxoleus if it's used in conjunction with appropriate orthotics and rehab. And we will be looking at specific video on this. There's evidence to support that Botox in the upper extremity may decrease later development of increased spasticity in the upper extremity. So there's evidence to support that that could end up helping them with function. And then um, in this systematic review showed that Botox in the upper extremities improved 
uh, activities involving the upper extremity. So there's some weak circumstantial evidence out there that's stating that if we decrease the tone with these medical management things, and then we capitalize on it with what we do best in therapy, then indeed you could improve function. So there's some evidence coming in on that. So let's talk about some of these drugs, oral drugs. Remember they were over in that left, upper left part of the quadrant, reversible, generalized. The number one drug out there is baclofen that is given orally. These are um, all out there. This is the most common one. You will see this. A lot of patients will have this. You don't need to know that the, the GABA receptors in the spinal cord, you're never going to be tested on this, but you just, if you want to be real smart or party or something, you bring this up. But the point is baclofen's number one up there. It does cause drowsiness and we'll look, most of these can. A diazepam, that's central nervous system, also known as Valium. So you can imagine, get a little groggy. And then there's dantrolene sodium, also known as dantrium. This actually acts at the skeletal muscle and it acts at the myoneural junction. You guys now know where that is. So that causes actually weakness at the muscle. And it's not necessarily specific to just the spastic muscle. The beauty of baclofen is, is that that is only because of where the GABA receptors are in the spinal cord. It's really only affecting the spastic muscles, not the normal muscles. Tizanidine, also called Neurontin, uh, frequently given to MS patients. So those are the ones you'll see out there. I wouldn't spend too much time memorizing this. The one that has to stick in your head is baclofen. <clears throat> And I will say, again, as PT assistants, this is not your job, but you should ask, are they taking it? And then just for of interest, you should ask how much and for how long have they been taking it? Because it is my experience after 36 years in the neuro world, especially in the skilled nursing world, that people are chronically underdosed with their baclofen, oral baclofen, and they're saying it doesn't work. Well, it doesn't work because they never really took a therapeutic dose. I don't really, that's beyond the scope of this lecture, but I want you to know that you should always go, hmm, are, are they taking enough? Because I can tell you right now that 10 milligrams three times a day is not enough. It's just been my experience, especially in spinal cord injuries, strokes, uh, in the MS patients, maybe. So you really need to pursue this with someone that knows more about it. Really not in your scope of practice, but you need to be in the know. All right, so let's talk about why oral medications. This is always going to be the first line of treatment. They're reversible and they're non-invasive if you consider taking chemicals into your body non-invasive. It's a uh, general systemic treatment for spasticity and it's effective for some to most patients if again dosed correctly it's difficult to get the optimal dosing effect and sometimes it takes a while one to two weeks to get them there so this is if you're you're at the very beginning of that um, a lot of these patients will come to you as outpatients and they actually will um, already have this on board and that's just kind of your baseline and then, of course, the big side effect is it causes drowsiness, hypotonia. Well, that's why they're taking it. And depending on which drug they're taking, it could actually cause weakness. There's general lethargy and altered mental status. So those are definite kind of drawbacks. So what are local blocks? So the different blocks out there, there's local anesthetics, lidocaine, bupivacaine. Uh, these last two to eight hours, you probably will never see these. There's neurolysis drugs. These used to be used a lot, but they're not so popular anymore. Phenol and alcohol, they last three to six months. They actually destroy the myelin sheath around the nerve and they just decrease that nerve conduction velocity. The one you will see lots of and hear lots of, patients will tell you, I had a Botox injection, is indeed Botox. There's different types of Botox out there. In this country, we use Botox A. Most of the time, it's actually a brand name Botox and it lasts for only three months and it works at the myoneural junction. It does weaken the entire muscle. It doesn't selectively weaken just the spastic component of the muscle. Big difference. So if they get, get an injection to their quadricep because that was spastic, they could lose strength in the quadricep, which is also something that they require to stand on during stance and to load on, right? So not always the best thing. So picking and choosing these is very important. Usually a physiatrist or 
uh, somebody who knows uh, a lot about gate uh, should be involved in this. It's just not a willy nilly. Oh, let's uh, let's just inject this thing because you know we can. And the other problem with Botox is that it, it is extremely expensive, and it does have to repeat it every three to six months, mostly every three months. So it's not really a permanent solution. So when somebody has gotten a Botox injection, that's when you as a treating physical therapy assistant really need to jump on the range, the motor program, the motor relearning, the skill acquisition, all that needs to occur in that three month window. We don't have a lot of time to wait. You need to, you need to jump on the bandwagon there, get with it and work on their strengthening. Super, super important to see what you can get strengthening the antagonist. Because you're like, well, Andrea, you just said their muscles weak. How can I strengthen it? Well, maybe it's because that muscle is spastic and now you can strengthen the opposing muscle group, whereas you weren't able to do that before. Maybe you can get range in that muscle, whereas you just couldn't do it before. That's why Botox is a interim therapy and we need to capitalize on it in that period of time. So intrathecal drug delivery, intrathecal baclofen is a little pump. It's a surgical intervention. It's implanted and this little thing's threaded into the intrathecal space and a little tube that goes inside the spinal canal and baclofen comes and um, dumps out. This is a very, very effective way to deliver the drug and you usually get great responses. This will wipe out any spasticity that's there. That being said, you will already have people that come to you that have pumps in place. There's not a whole lot you're gonna be doing with the dosing and, and intervention and all that. That's really kind of a subspecialty area, even within our field of physical therapy. It's something I spent a lot of time on. You as assistants, you need to be aware of pumps and some of the limitations that they may have if they're soon after pump implantation, what kind of things you should and shouldn't do. Patients usually know this. But more importantly, what you need to be aware of is intrathecal baclofen withdrawal or overdose. That does happen. If a patient starts acting weird, you've been seeing them, they had a pump, and all of a sudden they're saying, I'm super tired, I'm really lightheaded, they're having a hard time breathing, you need to immediately find out, A, have they had the dosing changed or the pump refilled or something changed? And if not, it doesn't matter, it's an emergency situation. And if they're, if they're more hypotonic, meaning not as spastic as you, you were remembering, we need to get them to the ER. The next would be a baclofen withdrawal. That would be something where they're um, demonstrating a lot of itching or rash or uh, their blood pressure super low, or they say they're running a fever, or they're feeling all these things crawling all over them, altered mental state. I would take these two, if you end up having, you're seeing neuro patients, you need to kind of have this on like a little cue card for yourself. I don't expect you to necessarily remember them right, right away and right off the bat, especially if you don't see a lot of patients. However, uh, you do need to know about this because you will get people that have pumps in this neuro uh, patient population and you need to understand one or the other and it can change. All right, so orthopedic surgery, um, obviously you're not gonna do this, you're not gonna be recommending it, people are gonna come to you status post or maybe they had one recommended. It is a, a focal treatment. We will see some videos of some patients in a second uh, that have had orthopedic surgery and pumps put in and you can see the end result and, and what, what can be done. Again, the take home message for you here is you shouldn't be afraid. You need to continue to work on what we're supposed to be work on, which is strengthening. You wanna make the move better. Remember, that's what we're doing. And so if somebody has helped intervene to decrease spasticity or increase range, like with an orthopedic surgery, we better not sit around on our, um, you know, on our haunches and just go, oh, wow, you just had that done. That's when we need to move and we need to get on it and use that range or use that newly movable joint or the muscles now that can be strengthened. So I can't emphasize that enough. It is not treating the spasticity directly. A lot of times it's just lengthening the muscle or fusing a joint, but the underlying etiology that was causing that spasticity, that loop is still going, but now they may have just fused that, that joint or something and it can't can't do what it did before. All right, so 
Let's talk about treatment recommendations. So remember, if the hypertonicity is generalized or focal, if it's generalized, if, remember that thing we looked at, oral medications, the SDR for pediatrics only, and ITB therapy. If it's a focal problem, injection therapies, or orthopedic surgery, these are um, options. And if it's a focal and a generalized problem, it's not uncommon that they may do something like ITB, and then they might do a surgical intervention. So they might piggyback it, but you will always address the uh, generalized one first. And again, not something that you're gonna be making decisions on, but just so you kind of know the reasons why. So here's that thing to remind you. Uh, it's just a nice little kind of visual for you to have. So you're in the know. So let's look at some treatment recommendations. So you remember we looked at this lady here when you watched her walk and this was a stroke patient and initially you may say, oh, well, she has a lot of tone in that left quad and that's why we're not getting the knee flexion we need. And uh, I really think I should talk to the therapist who then should talk to the neurologist, or the physiatrist about possibly looking at some tone management uh, for her. But remember when this lady goes in to um, the parallel bars, what happened? We see that she actually can break through it. So this was more a motor control issue um, in, in her case. And she, it's not a spasticity. She can break right through it in the tone. She just, this is a motor program problem. So this right here is telling us probably not a candidate. If there's weakness in these people, then we need to be addressing the weakness because when we take the spasticity away, a lot of times underneath, there's a lot of underlying weakness. So you can't ignore that. There is a school of thought that says that it isn't the spasticity, it's all about the weakness. And if we just got them stronger, they would actually move better. So that's a school of thought in the world of neuro in, in, in PT. So again, um, I, I want to empower you to know that you can make these differences. Now, is there a contracture stiffness? Now, this is something that I've seen a lot is people way, um, they kind of miss it totally. Again, remember, this is what we're supposed to be dealing with is contractures or stiffness. But this young man, he was so far gone, he already had a baclofen pump and he wasn't walking well. And they sent him to me and they said, why isn't he walking? Well, somebody forgot to take a look at this guy's plantar flexors, his calf muscles, which are contracted bilaterally. Look at that knee extension Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, video that back right to the beginning. Look at that, boom, boom. See that extension thrust? So that is the, that is the gait deviation that is the most obvious, the hyperextension at the knee and the extension thrust. I'm gonna let this run. But what I want you to understand is even in that AFO there, you see how he has that extension thrust because he has so much plantar flexion, he has contractures. It's not even just spasticity. His spasticity was managed by the baclofen pump, but this guy doesn't have, remember you have to have 10 degrees of dorsiflexion to get over that foot. He doesn't have it. So it's smashing that knee back on both sides. So what I want you guys to appreciate is again, it's the contracture the lack of dorsiflexion, I'm gonna show you this little thing here, tibia foot, it's the lack of dorsiflexion that comes forward that is inhibiting him from getting, so when he lands on it and he has that contracture and he puts his weight on it, it shoves his knee back because he doesn't have the range. And then he still has some spasticity in his plantar flexors. So super important that we also know this guy was a candidate for orthopedic surgery on one side and a candidate for serial casting on the other. And then his baclofen pump was also managing the spasticity, which was generalized spasticity because this young man had a brain injury. So let's look at him later on after he had the contractures managed after he had a locomotor training and worked on his gait, and we used some e-stim to re-educate him 
and we got his ITB pump, his intrathecal baclofen pump dialed in to just the right amount. And you can see that it's very, very neat on the difference. Now, doesn't he look like a totally different young man? This is the same guy. Now he's walking slow because we're telling him to work on the quality of his gait. It's very important for you to kind of stick with that. He can walk faster, but the point is, is now he's walking with a single point cane, I mean, a lobster and crutch, and he has a nice upright posture. He's not, doesn't have upper extremity, excessive upper extremity weight bearing. He has great, when you see the side view of this young man, you're gonna see that we got his tibias into neutral. We serial casted him on one side and he went and had the orthopedic surgery on the other side, the right side. And he's approaching a more normal gait. And it was very important for him to get away from that front wheeled walker. So those are kind of the morals of the story there for you is I don't want you guys to think that you need to be making all these recommendations, but I want you to know is that that stuff is out there. And again, all of these concepts, which are very big concepts, and we can drill really into them if you ever wanted to do that, but really for the scope of what you need to know right now, that's all you really need to know about spasticity management.